And it's a bittersweet thing overall. Brad Keithley, who is a former counsel and advisor for oil and gas companies, uh, retired now. He's also founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're going to delve down into things that are going on in the state of Alaska. Uh, some good news, some bad news. Uh, again, kind of a little bit of a bittersweet uh, 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 note here, starting things off with the gas line. Uh, then we're going to talk about the PFD. Brad Keithley talks uh, with us uh, this morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Michael. How are you today? You know what? Not a bad day, my friend. Not a bad day at all. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, governor's, you know, we call it the pipe dream, the gas pipeline uh, issue. Now, I just said it was kind of a, a little bit of a bittersweet thing because, I, I look, I, I would think that a gas line would be great for the state of Alaska for a multiplicity of reasons. Uh, you know, especially uh, Alaskans having access to their own resource, the ability to move the the, uh, the the resource to tidewater. I mean, all these things would be great. The only problem is is that it's got to be economical. It's got to be. It's got to fill, fit within the realm of the market. And unfortunately, that's not happening. So the governor making this announcement uh, at the Resource Development Council that uh, he is get, his gas line is essentially dead is a little bit bittersweet, but in the short term, I think it's good because it takes the focus off of something that was looking to suck a whole lot of oxygen out of the room. Yeah, I, I'm not sure the governor would agree with the characterization that is yet. Um, at the conclusion of the open season uh, last week, there he there was initially a, a press uh, release and, and some press commentary that the governor was declaring success as a result of the open season and that, and that uh, he, there was some statement of the effect that, you know, Alaska had never been this, this, uh, this far down the road of being able to monetize its gas. And he was really encouraged and, and, and saw a lot of progress uh, with respect to the open season. But then I think the reality of, of as people began learning the, the, the details of the open season and that in effect, uh, AGDC, uh, the Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, the state's arm dealing with the, the LNG project at this point, that in effect it had propped up the open season by uh, submitting nominations to ship gas that AGDC proposed to buy from the producers uh, on the project, and that was really what was supporting the project. As that reality, I think, started to dawn on people, um, uh, they realized that the governor's initial wave of optimism about the open season was misplaced. And then the governor, um, I think, realistically went before the Resource Development Council. Um, and, and while I don't think he would characterize it as the end of AGDC, effectively it is. The governor said he couldn't see a foresee a circumstance under which he would go back to the legislature uh, next year when AGDC's current, current funding runs out uh, and seek uh, additional funds. Unless, unless there was a, a dramatic change in, in where the project's going, so I think he's I think he's stepping up and recognizing reality. AGDC still has funding to go through the end, effectively through the end of next legislative session. They will still be out there trying to to, to affect a market, um, and and the way they will evidently, given the way they treated the open season, the way they will do it now is try to find purchasers of the gas that they're proposing to, to purchase uh, upstream from the uh, from the producers that's that's a huge risk I mean the state's taking a huge risk if they do that even if they find potential purchasers that raises huge huge risks so I, th I think we're effectively seeing the the beginning of the end of this approach uh, to monetizing uh, Alaska's gas as you uh, pointed you know out however it as you point out, it's critical that we find a way to monetize it at some point. Right, right. Well, and I, and I think you and I were, were chatting about this after the show last week uh, when this information was just coming out and, and, and looking at this. And, I mean, I was just shocked when they came out and said, yes, it's a success. And then we delved down into it and discovered, well, wait a second, the, the, the single largest purchaser, the single largest commitment – was from AGDC itself, and I, I I think I made the comment that basically, geez, I had no idea that a business sustainable business model looked like I could just <laughs> buy my own products for myself and be successful. Uh, you know, I mean that that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, uh, but this was this was the argument, and as you say, let's talk for a minute about 
the liability. I mean, being a state entity and owning the gas line is one thing, but being a purchaser and then marketer of the gas is a, I mean, that's a whole nother realm. It, it is because you have an obligation at the purchase end. I mean, the, the producers, Walker's been down this road before. The producers are not going to agree to a contract that, say, that says, uh, we'll give you whatever price we receive in the market, less our transportation costs, and, and we'll pay you the net back, what's called a net back contract. The producers aren't, aren't going to agree to that because the net back could be approaching zero, and so the producers are on the hook for paying to produce the gas, install the facilities to get the gas to the to the point of sale of the state, uh, and if it's approaching zero, they're not going to make any money at that. In fact, they, they may lose money. So the producers are never going to agree to a net back contract. They're going to want some term in there, some price term that says, you know, this is what we get uh, uh, under under any any circumstance. So so that's at the at the at the supply end. That's what the state's going to be faced with if it enters into these buy sale contracts. And then at the sale end, uh, purchasers aren't going to agree to pay. In, in today's market conditions, pre, pre, uh, purchasers aren't going to agree to pay, uh, you know, a price equal to whatever you bought it at plus whatever your transportation cost to get it to them is. They're going to be, you know, looking for competitive alternatives and, and have some sort of competitive ceiling on what they're willing to pay. So the state could easily, any purchaser, could easily get caught in in a, in a between a rock and a hard place with the price they're they're paying the producers uh, compared to the price that that they're receiving from the uh, from the purchasers and not be able to recover their costs you know themselves go into a lost position. Some uh, uh, entities uh, uh, willingly agree to that risk, but when they do, they have a broad based. Uh, uh, market, and they also have a broad-based supply, so they can mix and match their supplies to to meet their 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 broad-based market, and sort of you know run a business that 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 makes money or or tries to make money out of the out of the difference having a broad broad source of supply and a broad source of of market. The state wouldn't be in that position. The state would be stuck with uh, uh, producers in Alaska. Uh, and contracts, very you know, very focused contracts on Alaska. They would have you know markets that were that were there for Alaska gas, and they wouldn't have the ability to to switch back and forth or mix and match uh, uh, depending upon uh, market conditions. So the state would be at huge risk uh, going down that road, and and that's why it never that's why it's never made sense and didn't make sense when they announced the results of the open season. That it was the state that was going to be the the shipper and enter into these buy sell arrangements, just it's just too much risk uh, for the state to go to, to go down that road. Well, and again, this goes back to specialization and expertise. And the state, although it could be a, a good could be a good manager of a project, because that some of that stuff can be hired out. It it does not it does not have the expertise to market and sell gas. I mean that's a whole nother. I mean that's a whole component of an industry where the infrastructure that you'd have to build out inside of the state to even affect that is. I mean it, it it's astonishing. Well, the financial risk is just. I mean it, it wouldn't be as much infrastructure as it would be financial risk that the state would be would be uh, would be undertaking. The uh, the state has a role. I mean. I, where we were about 18 months ago or a year ago when we when we started down this road, I guess it's 18 months ago now, where we were was the state has a role uh, to play in terms of uh, potentially owning the infrastructure because of the tax benefits that the state could accrue that wouldn't accrue to uh, the private uh, producers. There is there is a role the state could play that would help reduce costs by uh, uh, not incurring income tax liability with respect to the with respect to the facilities. And I think everybody I think at the time that we that we started down this different role of AGDC playing a a higher level of uh, having a higher level of prominence um, I think everybody was focused on trying to obtain the benefits of that those cost benefits of reducing costs as a result of having the state own the facilities as opposed to the producers on the facilities. But now we, we, we've spun beyond that with the state now, you know, also playing the role of, of marketer, the buyer of the LNG and the seller of the LNG and taking that financial risk in the middle 
uh, and we've just gone off track, I think, with where uh, with, with where the the, the the what what people were thinking might be the the right road to be on. So, I, I we need we need to cycle back and pick up uh, the story where we were. I think when we were working with the producers and the producers were going down a road where they were going to be, you know, the sellers of their own product, uh, and try to pick up at that point. We we should not abandon. LNG and just say, well, that's off the table, and we're never going to do that, and 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 stop thinking about that. Frankly, if you look at Alaska's long-term economics, um, being able to monetize that gas is hugely critical um, uh, in the 2020s at some point, and being able to add that to our revenue base is hugely critical uh, if we're to avoid major, you know, taxes and and, and other uh, revenue options. So um, even even if we reduce the cost of government we need to we need to be able to monetize the lng or monetize the gas right so we need well, to, we need we need to cycle back and and, fi- and pick up where we have a success story going forward as opposed to this branch that we've taken the last 18 months yeah because just a reminder to folks uh, even uh, the even scott uh, goldsmith and the and the uh, icer uh, uh, you know kind of the plan that sustainability model counted on revenues from gas to help balance out that sustainable budget that we talked about. So gas has to figure prominently somewhere in the future into what we're doing. Yep, absolutely does. And and I think every administration has has realized that. I think Walker got off track uh, when, when the producer said, look, we either need to take a pause and figure out a, a, a cheaper, a better way to be doing what we're doing uh, before we before we plunge off into uh, the the next phase of project planning, or the state or the state can take a, take it over. And I and I think we got off track when the when the state decided to take it over at that point. There were there were hopes that that might work, but now we've seen where the end of that road is, and it's the state not only taking over the the, the facilities part of it to obtain the cost benefits of the tax structure, but now spinning off into uh, thinking that they would take market risk. So that's a dead end. Need to go back to where we branched off, just like you're drilling an oil well, right? If you have a if you have a, a, a problem down hole when you're drilling an oil well, you go back to the point at where you weren't having the problem, branch off uh, and and drill a drill a new hole from there. We need to go back up to where we where we started going down this dead end and pick back up where we were at that point and branch off and, and start working on a success case as opposed to this case. So it's about $70 million left in the AGDC budget. Um, it, it's going to wind down, as you said. There's still some work being done with FERC and other things. Can you, can you in the next two minutes, can you kind of uh, you know, line us out where AGDC is going to go, what they're going to do, and where does it leave us as, at a stopping point? Well, I think, I think AGDC needs to, needs to keep focused on what it takes to, 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 to project to, to uh, uh, move forward on the um, uh, progress there we go to move forward on the uh, on the facilities portion uh, get FERC approval uh, keep going down the road of getting FERC approval for the facilities LNG is going to be the right way to go no longer it doesn't make any sense to bring gas to the lower 48 so LNG is the way to monetize it they need to move forward on getting a structure in place to get the facilities built they need to move forward on confirming whatever whatever they need to do to confirm their tax status, um, and and put those pieces in place. Chasing down a market, spending money chasing down market for AGDC to resell gas they're going to buy from producers, frankly, is a waste of time. We're never going in that direction. The financial risks are too great, so they need to focus on the facilities and get that progressed as far as they can. Uh, to be ready to go uh, uh, when we go back upstream, pick up the right uh, success case, uh, and start putting it together. Um, wh- and, of course, there's a timeline here. This is the one thing that's troubled me, and we don't have much time left in this segment, but uh, there, there's always a lag time, right, from the time that we start building things. I mean, it's a four- or five-year window before you know anything ever ships from the time everything's approved and the e- environmental impact and all that. And so the problem is we've got to be able to have it, have the models out there, have it show that it's going to be affordable, do all that and put all the work in before that first, you know, cubic foot of gas ships. And and so what kind of g- give me a little bit on the timing here to make sure that we align with what the market is demanding and yet still have everything in place so that we can take advantage of it. 
Well, we, we need to, I mean, there is still a window in the 2020s. If you look at LNG projections, the LNG market is growing. Uh, the LNG supply side uh, is, is wobbling because of the current price uncertainty. There are some expansions going on, but, but, but not, not of the scale that, that could potentially or meet the potential market out in the 2020s. So we need, we need to continue on down the road of working on uh, getting the facilities ready, but we need to re-engage the producers um, and bring them back into the project uh, uh, in, 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 a, in the fashion that, that they were in before um, and, and work on that and, and pick that back up as soon as we can. Brad Keithley's our guest, our expert on oil and gas. He's also founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We'll continue with him here in just a moment. The Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. There's too much confusion. Brad Keithley is the founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He's also a former oil and gas counsel and consultant who brings some expertise to the table as far as uh, oil and gas issues, and of course the sustainability of the budget is 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 numero uno on our minds here as we look at what's going on around the state of Alaska, uh, and of course the the economy as a whole uh, in a recession, continuing recession. A, uh, AEDC even saying that they're expecting an additional year now, uh, and of course the actions of the legislature as of late have not helped, including. The tax on the PFD. Now, we had some arguments from some listeners and others here in the last uh, couple of weeks that have said, oh, no, no, it's not a tax. It's not a tax at all. Brad uh, decided to definitively lay down an argument that, yes, yes, in fact, it is a tax. And uh, he's laid that out on his blog. You can go find that at uh, uh, his uh, Thoughts on Oil and Gas blog, uh, which we have links up to on our Facebook page right now to check it out. Brad, uh, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Michael. So, uh, yeah, anytime you take money out of people's pockets, it's a tax. Now, whether the money went through the people's hands in the first place or was supposed to be dispersed, it still is our money, although that seems to be an argument that they keep trying to move around. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's funny that people uh, want to argue that the PFD cut isn't an income tax. The latest iteration has come out of the Supreme Court's decision where the Supreme Court said that uh, the PFD, you, you, the state essentially can default on the PFD if it wants to, that it can decide to short fund uh, the permanent fund dividend in the same way it could short fund K-12 through education, it could short fund uh, any of the other uh, formula programs that the state's got out there, including in, including you know payments to its own employees, the, the, the contract it's entered into. That's a general rule. Of, of of government that the that the state uh, can go can use the appropriation process essentially def to default on any of its obligations, and the Supreme Court decision is, uh, essentially says yeah the state can do that as well to the PFD, but that doesn't reach the issue of whether the PFD cut is a tax on individuals. That to me is much more focus is is much more a statutory issue. Uh, the Supreme Court decision didn't reach the statute, the state statute, that says that 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 says that 50 percent of the earnings from the permanent fund will be will go to citizens for dividends. That's still in the statute. The Supreme Court didn't even touch on that. So that creates that statute creates the revenue stream, the, the obligation that the state has uh, to pay out a portion of the permanent fund earnings, 50 percent of the permanent fund earnings uh, to uh, the citizens in the form of the permanent fund dividend. That's an earnings stream. That's a revenue stream to individuals, just like uh, a, a, to an individual, you know, dividends or interest it earns off of, that individual may earn off stocks and bonds is a revenue stream to them as well. The permanent fund dividend uh, essentially is is a is a, a earnings stream, a, a an investment stream, managed by the Permanent Fund Corporation for the benefit of Alaska's citizens with an obligation to pay out 50% of that. So when the state cut back, cuts back on that 50% statutory obligation and withholds that income uh, and diverts it to state government, that is as much a tax uh, as if the state said, uh, all that dividend and interest you're getting from 
from third parties, we want a portion of that, and we're going to tax, uh, divert a portion of that uh, over to uh, over to our uh, over to the government accounts. Or if the state said all those employers out there that are paying uh, uh, earnings to uh, uh, to the state's residents, we're going to pass a law that says you've got to divert a portion of that. You've got to withhold uh, income from a portion of that and uh, and pay pay that over to the state. So it's a tax in the sense that you're, in the very real sense, that you're converting money that's otherwise supposed to be going uh, into the private sector, into the hands of Alaska individuals. You're diverting, you're withholding that and diverting that over into government instead. That's the, that's the economic definition of a tax. Some people want to argue that, that there's a different legal definition, um, uh, but, but what really matters here is the, is the economic effect of what you're doing. And given the state statute that says 50% of earnings are supposed to go to Alaska individuals, uh, 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 in the pro, in the budget process, diverting a portion of that over to government is the economic is, is the has the economic effect of a tax uh, the same as any other. Well, and and I think this is that you know th- this last week was the first time that I've I've actually ran into somebody who was like, well, you know. I'm okay if we only get a thousand because that's the average and blah, 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 blah. It was just like, to me, it was kind of shocking uh, because it was a business owner who said that. And so we got into this discussion about this, you know, and and the taxation and what the true, what the true measure of the money is and everything else. And, and, and here's the thing. I mean, this is a kind of, to me, it's kind of an insidious thing uh, when we start talking about it, because when they start treating it as if it is some kind of government largesse, then people uh, kind of, again, I think, come up with that feeling of, oh, I'm just happy to receive my thousand bucks then of the government largesse. Not that, hey, that was my money and now you're taking it from me. I should be outraged instead. And so it it has the danger in my mind of changing the argument and moving the ball around so that people are less uh, are less upset about it. And to me, that's just a it's a it's a stepping stone onto again in the long run taking a crack at the corpus of the fund and other things that could e- lead to even more disastrous effects for the state of Alaska. Yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of, um, oh, for lack of a better word, shape-shifting going on try, that the government's been trying to do around, around the permanent fund for the last couple of years. For years and years and years and years, decades, uh, the, the permanent fund dividend was treated essentially as an off-balance sheet, an off-income statement item by government. It was put in the in the dedicated or, or designated general fund category, the revenues came in and they went out, um, sort of passing passing off budget, if you will, through the designated general fund category, and no one really paid attention to it. A couple of years ago, uh, and I noted this at the time and, and and talked about it. I think we talked about it on the show at the time. Uh, the uh, legislative finance division, legislature's le- legislative finance division. And the, and the governor's office of management and budget, both of whom are sort of the gatekeepers for how you account for things, made a huge change. Instead of taking the permanent fund revenues, uh, permanent fund dividend revenues through the DGF accounts, uh, the designated general fund accounts, they started putting them into the UGF accounts, the undesignated general fund uh, uh, accounts, um, and, and treating it as a revenue stream to government and then treating the PFD as a cost. Uh, as a use of these UGF funds uh, that were that were then you know competing with or, or set up to look like they were competing with spending on education and on health and social services and on uh, the university and and in all of the other categories of spending and running it through the UGF and just treating it as normal government revenue and that that had the effect, I think, on on legislators and on others who said, "Oh, well, yeah, well, it's just government government money, so yeah, it's competing with K through 12, and we don't want to, you know, we don't want to low fund or, or short fund K through 12, so we'll just take it out of the out of these other UGF categories, including the permanent fund dividend." There's there's been a lot of of effort given to changing the dynamics of the debate. Um, uh, as opposed as, as as opposed to you know subsequently tr- suddenly trying to address the state's economic issues um, and and this argument that oh it really isn't a tax it's government revenue and 
And, you know, government's just, you know, taking its revenue for its, for another purpose as opposed to distributing it to citizens. So it's not really a tax on citizens. That's just another effort to try to, to try to redirect the debate. The important thing that we need to be focusing on is economic effect of what we're doing. And nothing has changed the ICER analysis made a year ago that cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect on the overall state economy. It has the, it has the effect of it, it, it reduces overall income the most of any of these so-called new revenue options. It reduces Alaska income the most. It reduces Alaska jobs the most of all, any of these so-called uh, new revenue options. It has the largest adverse effect on, on the state economy. It also has, by far, according to ICER, the largest adverse effect uh, on Alaska families uh, cutting the PFD. More than sales tax, more than the income tax, has the largest adverse effect on that. that right. That's what's important. The economic effect is what's important and what we need to keep the focus on. Well, and I saw some commentary because you and I have talked about this ad nauseum, quite honestly, uh, about the effect on the economy. And I saw some I saw some commentary uh, on a Facebook post or something that I made, and, and somebody said, "Oh, you and Keith Lee, you know, he's a Democrat anyway, and he's talking about this, and he just cares about the low income people, and blah blah blah." And then I, and I pointed out this the the numbers that you had laid out there, basically talking about, I mean, not just the low income. Low income obviously is 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 affected the most but even upper and middle incomes even you know i mean i'm i'm going to be affected it's like five six eight percent of my overall income folks who are in middle you know total middle income it's like eight nine twelve percent i mean we're talking about we're talking about a significant hit on people's income and they treat it like it's nothing yeah the the in, the, the effect on the top 20 percent is less than two percent it reduces the top 20% income by less than 2%. The next 20%, the upper middle income, it affects by, by, by more than 5%. So it's more than double the effect on the, on the next 20%. The, 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 the upper middle income bracket is more than double the effect on the, on the, on the highest income bracket. So it's, this, isn't, this isn't about being worried about low income. This is being worried about the other, the entire other 80%. Uh, of the uh, uh, of of the Alaska popu of Alaska families in the Alaska population. Yeah, and, and and I think that that needs to be pointed out. I mean, they keep crowing about how the fact that they stood against an income tax and did all this has a deeper effect than all of that. Yep. And it will continue to have yeah. an effect year upon year. Uh, and, and again, the yeah, more and that they the more that they cut at it. The, the bigger the effect is going to be. And let's let's face it, as the market continues to grow and the stock market continues to go up and this growth under the permanent fund, we saw Rodell's commentary on the permanent fund the other day, as it continues to go up. I mean, next year, the permanent fund could be, you know, could have been, the PFD could have been 25 or 2600 bucks. And and so instead, we'll still get our 1000 or our 1100 and now it'll be 1500 or 1400 instead of 1100 and, and every year it could go up. In five years, they could be taking $2,000 from every man, woman, and child in the state. And you just look at that kind of growth and go, ow, what's going to happen then? Yeah. And it's, and it's not just citizens, Michael. It's not just, it's not just the, the impact on families. It's the impact on the overall economy. The ICER yeah. analysis says, for every dollar distributed as a D, as a PFD, we get a dollar. Alaska gets a dollar forty in income. For every dollar distributed as as taken or distributed or affected through an income tax, you get less than a dollar forty. So we're hurting the overall economy the most uh, by cutting by cutting the PFD at exactly the wrong point in time. Yep, absolutely. Brad Keithley, uh, Thoughts on Oil and Gas is his blog. We've got links up on our website. Thanks for coming in and joining us, my friend. It, uh, I think you've made your point. I hope people out there are getting it. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, Michael. The Michael Luke Show continues. Hour three, dead ahead. Your phone calls on oldies.